You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Daniel Sinner. Four years after the beginning of the financial crisis, the British Chancellor George Osborne announced the biggest shake-up of the banking industry in decades. He warned this week that 2013 is the year we reset our banking system. First, we've got a brand new watchdog with new powers to keep our banks safe so they don't bring down the economy. Second, we've got a new law to separate the branch on the high street from the dealing floor in the city to protect taxpayers when mistakes are made. Third, we're going to start with the industry changing the whole culture and ethics of the business so that it works for you. And fourth, we're going to give customers the most powerful weapon of all, choice. Real choice about who you bank with. The choice to change who you bank with if you want a better deal. Under the Chancellor's banking reform bill, the public will be given more power and more choice. They'll be able to switch bank accounts in just a week and the time it takes to transfer money and for cheques to clear will also be cut. It's part of his plan to take on the monopoly of banking giants, who he says are dominating the market. For banks, the Chancellor has threatened to break up institutions that break the rules, and he's warned that the government won't bail them out. But at the heart of the changes, the Chancellor will ring fence banks' high street operations from their investment arms. He says he wants future chancellors to be able to keep the bank branches going while letting the investment arm fail. The British Banking Association says the proposals have created massive uncertainty in the sector and that the plans were bad economics. But what do my panel of experts think about the chancellor's major reforms? In the studio, I'm joined by Jason Correan. Senior Finance Editor at the Economist Intelligence Unit and Robert Oxley is Campaign Manager at the Taxpayers Alliance. Joining us on the phone is Kevin Mountford, Head of Banking at MoneySupermarket.com and Dr Richard Wellings is Deputy Editorial Director at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Rob Oxley from the Taxpayers Alliance. Do you think the Chancellor's plans are a step in the right direction? Well, look, I think there are good parts and bad parts to what the Chancellor is proposing, but I think what the priority should be is ensuring that we don't have any future bailouts. We saw the terrible deal that taxpayers got out of the last one, and what the steps should be when looking to banking is how we actually protect taxpayers when a bank goes bust, not actually protecting the banks. Jason Correan from the Economist Intelligence Unit. Yeah, well, I think it's certainly a more aggressive approach than a lot of other countries in the EU. And uh, but the reforms deal mainly with the structure of the banking system, and I think that's useful. But in a sense, it's uh, just half of the story. I think more needs to be done, uh, particularly on leverage and capital ratios, that will truly uh, be kind of preventative medicine to uh, prevent uh, future uh, bank busts. Kevin Mountford from MoneySupermarket.com. I think it represents a much needed start to the process. I think it's, um, it is overdue. Um, and I, I tend to agree that it's the balance between the more tangible structural changes and some of the more softer things around cultural change um, that, that clearly is going to take time to, to play out. Dr. Richard Wellings from the Institute of Economic Affairs. Well, I think the, the government's right to be looking at ways of shielding the taxpayer from future bank collapses, but this really doesn't deal with the fundamental causes of financial crises, which are um, the uh, moral hazard leading to excessive risk-taking and also uh, the inflation created by central banks, which destabilizes the economy. Rob Oxley, from what you've just heard from Dr. Richard Wellings, would you agree? Well, I think there's a point to be made that um, protecting taxpayers should be the priority. What we saw is uh, with Northern Rock and the the measures that the Chancellor say are proposing with ring fencing, that isn't actually going to stop a bank going bust. You look at the banks that needed bailing out last time. There were Northern Rock, there were Bradford and Bingley, there were HBOS. These were banks which were actually kind of, their focus was um, uh, kind of normal retail lending. So the idea of creating this false separation with ring fencing, you know, George Osborne's labelled it an electric ring fence, that it won't actually address the issue. 
issue that when it came down to it, politicians were willing to step up with other people's money to play the financial markets. And we know we've seen today, we, we see that you know you just have to go and look at the, the share price for RBS and you know how terrible a deal we've got. So I think look, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric in here. But what, what should be the focus is not actually protecting the banks, not actually make, saying that you know we're going we're gonna to decouple the risk from retail for from investment. What it should be is saying, look, you know, when a bank does go bust, and there has to be that opportunity of a bank going bust, there should be the right measure so it can be done in in the right measure in the right way, not in the the, the sense where we had kind of uh, Lehman Brothers, where we had this collapse, which which obviously had huge ramifications for all those involved. Kevin Mountford, what are you, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I I agree. I think you know there is a perceived uh, perceivement that investment banking tends to be more risky, but you know as we've just heard. The examples here in the UK of recent have been, you know, traditional retail retail banks. I think the, the one thing about this is that always concerns with the increased cost of administering um, the regulation in this way. It could, in some shape or form, still get passed on to the consumer. So, um, you know, ultimately the cost of us doing business um, increases accordingly. So, yeah, I think, you know, we just have to see how things play out. But in, in reality, somebody's going to have to pay for this. So this is not going to be a good deal for consumers as far as you're concerned? Well, I think there's the, the underpinning confidence. I think we all agree that you need a healthy financial sector, certainly in terms of underpinning the economy. And consumers need to have confidence. And when I talk about confidence, I think first and foremost, there's the basic trust. You know, will a bank look after my money? Pretty much in most cases, it will. But will it actually do the right things for me as a, as a customer, whether I'm a consumer in the retail space or a small business? And I think that's where the big question marks really lie. Dr. Richard Wellings, is this a bad deal for consumers then? Yes, I think so. I think it's likely to be counterproductive. I mean, every economic crisis is different, but it's conceivable that in some future crisis, then actually a diversification and having the investment arm might actually be an asset and it could actually reduce risk. Because, for example, if you've got a property collapse, but if other assets were doing rather well, then this could be a good thing. And also, obviously, it creates a lot of risk for UK banks and might deter investors, and that will have a knock-on effect on bank lending. And there are, obviously, there's a proportion of businesses that are very heavily reliant on bank lending for investment and that will have a further knock-on effect on recovery so there are very severe downsides to this policy even though the fence has been electrified that's still going to have a knock-on effect it isn't a complete separation uh, well what concerns me it's actually the separation that concerns me and i think that there are advantages to to diversification and having um, the banks uh, operating in different different fields i just saw these mortgage banks with northern rock are particularly vulnerable and there are good economic reasons for that because long-term assets such as property tend to be extremely volatile due to due to the impact of central bank inflation and boom bust in the property market has been going on for decades and decades. So I, I actually think having a if you like a, a wider diversity of, of loan assets is an advantage in many instances. A reminder that you're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Daniel Sinner. Joining me for a discussion on the British Chancellor's shake-up of the banking industry is Jason Correan, Senior Finance Editor at the Economist Intelligence Unit. Robert Oxley is Campaign Manager at the Taxpayers Alliance. Kevin Mountford is Head of Banking at MoneySupermarket.com. And Dr Richard Wellings is Deputy Editorial Director at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Jason Crane, do you think a wider diversity is an advantage? Uh, it can be. I mean, I I, th- I think uh, on this on this point that anything that makes the banks uh, safer at the moment will also make them less profitable. I think that's that's that, that almost follows as a as a matter of course. And and what that what, what that means is that the the sort of era of light touch regulation and of and of, and of extremely cheap credit is is over. And I think costs will go up as as a re- result. And and. Uh, in a in a way that is the price of having a, a safer banking system, and I think this kind of electric ring fence is an interesting concept. I think it's kind of funny in the sense that uh, the chancellor and the government thinks it's a bad idea to break up the banks, but that is a good threat to sort of hang over the, over them. And so uh, I, I think just that uh, banking in general is become going to become more expensive. But I think that's kind of a reflection of of, of how um, credit was mispriced before. You see this as a weapon in George Osborne's back pocket then? Yeah, it seems to be. I don't 
necessarily think it will be used. I think there's a bit of a catch-22 there because uh, if he would, needed to break up RBS, for example, that, that would be extremely damaging to the investment that all UK taxpayers have in that bank. So he's he's kind of needs to sort of talk out of both sides of his mouth in a sense. Do you think it's going to be a valuable weapon? Are business really going to take him seriously? Well, I think you have to take a threat like that seriously. And I, and I, and I think just if you see the market value that is attached to uh, UK banks at the moment tend to be a lot lower than, than other banks in Europe and particularly uh, North American banks. And I think that uh, the aggressiveness of regulation in that in that sense is a, is a reflection that that, that this, these are some, some fairly credible threats. Rob Oxley, this is a weapon in George Osborne's back pocket, but is it one that the taxpayers will see as a very serious threat to banks? Well, the problem is, is that politicians have so consistently got it wrong with banks in the last decade and you know either you know if George Osborne is introducing these new laws banks should either follow them or not and if they don't follow them they should be prosecuted in the same sense that anyone else breaks the law the idea that they'll have this kind of extra extra weapon in his pocket well you know that just creates uncertainty and it it sounds very good you know an electrified ring fence sounds very good isn't this what the public wanted to see they wanted to see the chance to take a tougher stance against the banks well the problem was that we didn't have a lack of regulation in the last financial crisis it was about the way that regulators actually applied that regulation and you know we have to look at those people who kind of looked over that time and, and turned a blind eye you know people like people at the FSA have some serious responsibilities over what has happened during this financial crisis and look you know, we have issues we've been talking about LIBOR all week you know the the fixing of the, the the rate at the LIBOR rate now not only did that have actually an effect probably on the amount that taxpayers paid into it but also you know it looks at what you know with taxpayers effectively having that stake in RBS, and as you mentioned, you know, if we're going to break up RBS, you know, that, that, that might seem a, that would return a bad investment for UK taxpayers. The point is, is that when taxpayers do have this investment in banks, they're exposed to any of the behaviour that RBS do at the time or, or their previous actions, and that's why there's this big debate about who would pay the LIBOR fine. But the point here is, is that when politicians do start meddling in that sense, they so often the risk that they expose and the the, the kind of the re, the repercussions of their choices aren't paid by the politicians, they're paid by the, the, the people who've ended up having to stump up for that stake. And so actually what I would love to see from Osborne is his focus about ensuring that RBS pay back that stake uh, that taxpayers have forked out as soon as possible and ultimately selling those shares as soon as possible because at the moment shareholders such as taxpayers, they can't decide that actually we don't like the behaviour of the bank so we're going to sell our shares. They can't actually have any influence on the bank's decision. So I think that's what the best thing is actually getting us out of uh, the banking industry as soon as possible rather than trying to fiddle with it. Kevin Mountford, you heard the concerns there from Rob Oxley about the watchdog, the FSA, not being a watchdog, more of a lapdog. Do you think the new watchdog that's being proposed by George Osborne is going to have more teeth? Well, again, only time will tell, but let's hope that the, the lessons are learned. But, but I agree. I think that, you know, there's many people that still blame the banks um, for the economic crash and they've you know, been blighted ever since with one scandal after the other. And so some of the situation is very much self-inflicted, but they are also easy game. And, and I agree. I think the policing of, of, of all of this through a decade of, and plus of growth, that the, the regulators have got a lot to answer for. But people wanted to see action. Um, but, but I think it, it creates a really interesting landscape now for, for banking per se particularly as we're seeing, you know, uh, um, an evolution of consumer behaviour. And at one end, you know, we still want to walk into a branch and have a checkbook. At the other, we want to use a, a mobile phone application. And this is an industry that also has gone through major consolidation and, it, and is wrapped up in legacy platforms and all of that. So I think it's, it's, it's a really interesting situation. But equally, as part of the... Um, this decade whereby we argue the regulators weren't necessarily policing to the extent they should. We've all got a lot to answer for because we got caught up in all of the price-led propositions and, and there's an expectation around that. And, and so I think we also need a great deal more transparency. And going back to my earlier point about doing the right thing is, is to show the cost of products to actually not try and catch people out with onerous terms and conditions. So I think there's got to be a levelling of the playing field and a readjustment so we create a model that is far more sustainable. And then we can start thinking about good old things like, you know, service levels, etc. So as I say, I think we've, we're entering into a really interesting phase.
Dr Richard Wellings from the Institute of Economic Affairs. One of George Osborne's first policies when he outlined this speech um, this week, he said we've got a brand new watchdog with new powers. How do the banking industry see this new watchdog? Well, they're quite worried about it, particularly the, the power going ahead where this watchdog could actually force them to break up uh, their, their, their company, which obviously creates risk for people in, investing and so on. But I actually think... Um, Following on from, from Kevin's comments, regulation actually has been the problem and it's created this false sense of security among depositors. So they thought, oh, the regulators dealt with all the risks, so we can go for, to the bank with, that pays a slightly higher interest rate like iSave or Northern Rock. We need to get away from that, possibly phase our deposit insurance and actually um, sort of breed a con- culture of conservatism, get rid of this moral hazard so that people actually take care when they're giving their money to banks. Do you think that it's enough to change bankers' behaviour? Yeah, I think, I think actually removing deposit insurance would because uh, customers would then look very carefully at the bank where they were, that they were giving their money to and that would in turn uh, create, a, if you like, incentives for banks to promote a, a conservative culture within themselves. If you look at the history, this is what used to happen in the 19th century. So uh, Barclays was actually founded by Quakers and part of the selling point of Barclays was that it was extremely trustworthy because of the religion of its founders. Jason Korean from the Economist Intelligence Unit, this conservative culture that you've just heard Dr. Richard Welling speak about, does that worry you? It doesn't worry me. I mean, I, I, I think bankers could cert- certainly uh, uh, be more conservative than they were pre-crash. But I, I, I do think that the best way, you know, there's, there's these, this kind of inquiry into, into, into banking practices and ethics and all this kind of thing. And um, the latest banking bill deals with the structure of banks, but what I think really the most simple, transparent, clear way to promote stability in banks is simply to uh, limit limit the leverage that they're that, that they're able to operate at and boost the capital that they need to hold against their assets. I think very clear, strict rules on that is the best preventative medicine. So you want stricter banks. rules than we have at the moment? Yes, I think so. I, I, and, I, and I think it's quite in- interesting that we have you know Mark Carney coming over from Canada to become the next governor of the, of the Bank of England, Canada has a quite a strict uh, leverage cap on its banks at 20, 20 times assets. Um, in the UK at the moment, we're talking about 33 times, um, which is which is obviously much higher, and that's in fact higher than what the uh, the Independent Commission on, on on Banking proposed. And I think a lot of the EU regulations on on banks and capital leverage, which the UK uh, must uh, uh, apply as a minimum, are being watered down by the by the bank lobby, and and so I think that that type of regulation making that stricter as it is in places like Canada, which which uh, performed quite well during the financial crisis is really the only way to um, to promote a more stable banking system beyond all this this kind of more squishy things about ethics and, and, and practices and this sort of thing. Rob Oxley, how do you feel about more rules and stricter regulations? Well, I don't think we saw rules and regulations, strict regulations, stopping what happened in 2008. I think the the best thing that we could really do is get rid of this implicit subsidy that banks seem to think, this idea that banks are too big to fail, Um, because that is what ends up dragging taxpayers into these kind of bailouts, this idea that we can't let a bank go to the wall. Now, there clearly are, you know, there are are different ways of letting a bank go to the wall. There's, you know, a a controlled solution where uh, taxpayers are protected, depositors are protected in the right way, but ultimately Ultimately, you know, if a bank is going to go, it's going to go, and that's the shareholders will have to bear the costs of that and the decisions that you know, those executives made. But what we can't have this situation is where effectively banks think they can take on risky behaviour because ultimately there will be somebody else who will step in and put up you know, that wedge of cash to ensure that, you know, that, that things are met. And that's Isn't what, this what George Osborne means when he says he'll let the investment arms fail but the bank branches keep going? But I, 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 you had, as I said at the start, the, the banks which actually went to the wall, they were the resi- they were the the, the high street retail banks. They were Northern Rock, they were HBOS, they were Bradford and Bingley. These were the guys who weren't you know, the investment banks. And what we had the trouble there is that they were basically investing in property and not actually having the capital to back that up. So you know, the idea that you could just simply sl- separate these banks off won't work in the end. And all it would do is create uncertainty in the system, which would damage the entire financial sector, which is something that Britain is so reliant on, given the amount of money it sticks into the Treasury's coffers every day. A reminder that you're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Daniel Sinner. Joining me for a discussion on the British Chancellor's shake-up of the banking industry is Jason Correan, Senior Finance Editor at the Economist Intelligence Unit. Robert Oxley is Campaign Manager at the Taxpayers' Alliance. 
Kevin Mountford is head of banking at MoneySupermarket.com and Dr Richard Wellings is deputy editorial director at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Dr Wellings, what are your thoughts about stricter regulation then, as you heard from Jason Corayan? Uh, well, there seems to be a lack of coherence in, in government policy. So on the one hand, uh, they're talking about increasing the, the capital cushion, and that, that's also happening at an international level as well, which will tend to reduce bank lending. But on the other hand, you've got these massive amounts of money being printed by the Bank of England to try and increase bank lending. And then you've got these uh, various government loan guarantees as well to try and increase bank lending. So there's a complete lack of coherence. And of course, all this, uh, the QE being done by the Bank of England, that's actually in the long run likely to destabilize the economy once again as it gets fed through into to greater inflation. So really, the, we need some more joined up thinking when it comes to this. Kevin Mountford, consumers turn to your website, moneysupermarket.com, and, and say, look, I want the best rate for my savings account, I want the best rate for my current account. How do you think all of this is going to change for consumers? Um, well, I think on the, on the face of it, I mean, we talked about more regulation, increased powers, possibly, you know, a need for more conservatism from, from the banks. So how we balance that with the need of of consumers and also going back to Osborne's speech, an environment that creates new competition. And and as I say, I think changing consumer behavior suddenly creates opportunities for new types of organizations that we see in the shadow banking sector with the likes of payday loans now, peer-to-peer lenders. And these are happening because they're filling gaps that, 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 that the banks that traditionally did, are no longer doing. And, and as I say, coming back to Osborne's speech, I think he said it's going to be a revolution for consumer choice. So I'm really interested to see how all of this balances out. And with every change, and we just took quantitative easing, you know, funding for lending, all of these initiatives that may be the right thing for various reasons, there's winners and there's losers. And those winners and losers are even at the consumer level. Rob Oxley from the Taxpayers Alliance, this idea that banks are going to serve consumers, do you think this is going to translate into better lending to small businesses and better savings rate for consumers? Well, we've clearly got a problem with lending to businesses and also you know, interest rates and the, gov- the fact that the government continue to print funny money via, monet- via quantitative easing. But what we do have and what a lot of people have spoken about is kind of these zombie firms which are being kept alive by l- artificially low rates. And the fact is that is preventing capital being uh, reassigned with it within the country. But look, you know, what we really need to see from a system is we do need to see uh, businesses getting support from banks. But the, the, the way you're not going to create that is by continuing continuing on with this kind of stagnating economy and George Osborne and politicians tinkering with the system and, and making so many, making investments so uncertain. Do you see this as tinkering then? Well, we've seen, look, if you want to go back, kind of look at the, look what George Osborne has done in his time as Chancellor. He has hiked ca- taxes 299 times and, and cut them about 100 times. That was TPA research. Now, one thing that does is it means that the, the, the tax system in this country is incredibly unstable. It means that investors can't actually, investors who are making big decisions which aren't going to be in the space of a year, we're talking like five, ten years, that actually makes the system less stable and it makes investors less encouraged to actually invest in things. And so that's where we really need to address this. Basically, we need to restore some and a lot of that comes down to what Osborne has done. Because at the moment, you know, he's got even his own backbenchers kind of s- accusing him of being the continuity of Gordon Brown, continuing on with just the, the same failed policies and not actually doing something radical to really kickstart the economy. And that's where, you know, that's where government really needs to take action, is actually to make it easier in this country for, by reducing the regulations on businesses, by actually reducing the kind of taxes that they're paying. That is the way that you'll kickstart the economy. That's the way that you'll get businesses growing. And that's the way that ultimately you'll end up having credit lent to those businesses as well. Jason Crane, what are your thoughts from what you just heard from Rob Oxley? Yeah, well, I, I, I think it is an interesting supply versus demand problem here because, um, you know, clearly the, the, the provision of credit in the UK economy is quite weak at the moment. But uh, I do think that in a certain degree, there's there's not a lot of demand for credit also. I think the, the, the very largest companies, get its uh, credit is cheap and plentiful for them, but, you know, it's obviously harder for, for, for smaller companies companies. But, uh, you know, we expect the UK economy to grow by half a percent this year, a little bit more than one percent for the next few years after that. UK exporters are not are not doing great at the moment. There's a lot of problems, obviously, in the Eurozone and, 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 and other countries. So 
it's easy to blame the banks because they played such a huge part in the the, the recent financial crisis. But um, I think things like the funding for lending scheme do help a bit because they they tie banks' uh, lending decisions. Um, uh, you know, they, they it's, it sort of forces them to uh, lend more. But I do think that there's just not a lot of demand for credit out there amongst these these uh, small private companies who are who are currently squawking. So I think it's 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 good to kind of take a step back there and say that it's not all the banks' fault, really. Do you think it will change their culture and ethics, which is what George Osborne wants to do? Well, the, I, I think things like the funding for lending scheme certainly give them a better incentive to lend to smaller businesses because it's, it's more sort of explicitly tied to the amount of cheap money that they get. And so that's cert- certainly a step in the right direction, I think. But, you know, as far as the ethics and behavior of bank goes, that's that's just such a such a bigger problem that I don't think anybody at the Treasury or the Bank of England or any any kind of a, a official body can really influence. And, 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 and that's why I think really the best way to um, promote uh, um, stability is is through higher capital ratios and lower leverage limits. And the operating within that, by definition, makes you more conservative. Dr. Richard Wellings, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, I'm actually quite skeptical about funding for lending. And there's a danger that the, the taxpayer will end up on the hook for a lot of uh, bad loans to businesses that wouldn't otherwise survive. Um, and it, uh, a more general point is we shouldn't get too fixated about bank lending as well. I think um, reducing the amount of borrowing in the private sector is probably a, a very much needed adjustment given the excesses of, of previous years during the boom period. And also a, a high proportion of small businesses don't actually rely on bank lending for their capital. They rely on retained profits uh, equity, uh, money from family members and so on. So, so why do you think we are constantly always hearing about lending for small businesses then? Well, I think, I think it's a mistaken belief that bank lending is really the engine of the economy when there are a lot of, lot of other uh, prices going on. I mean, I think really the Chancellor's main focus should be on regulation. And unfortunately, his attitude to the banking sector is also replicated across the economy. We've seen very, very little progress on deregulation. In fact, been, the regulation has been piled on uh, during his tenure, a lot of it coming from Brussels, of course. But really, this is the major problem. And, and his attitude to banking is just really typical of the overall this government's attitude to regulation across the board. And finally, Kevin Mountford from MoneySupermarket.com. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the point earlier about supply and demand is a relevant point. I think it's the right type of supply. Um, banks typically will argue that they hit the targets. End users will say, well, even if we want to borrow some money, the terms are not right. I think fundamentally we have got a huge um, confidence issue here. I think, you know, everybody needs to, to play a part and, and try, if there are any, to look for some positives. Um, but, but equally, things like funding for lending, as I, I mentioned earlier, you know, there's, there's two prongs to that. It's not only going to hopefully kickstart some lending. It actually makes it fundamentally cheaper for banks to do business. You know, we got to a, a, an unsustainable position. The banks were fighting for retail deposits, and they were paying five, six times bank base rate. So they're massively, artificially high. Um, but I wonder at the moment, you know, although we've always had a rhetoric about trying to save medium long term, I actually wonder whether anybody is really interested. I mean, what they'd like us to do is spend whatever cash we've got and, you know, get the tills ringing in the high street. So this is my point earlier. There are winners and losers, losers in all of these things. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time for today's discussion. Thank you to all of my guests, Jason Corayan from the Economist Intelligence Unit, Rob Oxley from the Taxpayers Alliance, Kevin Mountford from MoneySupermarket.com and Dr. Richard Wellings from the Institute of Economic Affairs. And he's warned that the government won't bail them out. But at the heart of the changes, the Chancellor will ring fence banks' high street operations from their investment arms. He says he wants future chancellors to be able to keep the bank branches going while letting the investment arm fail. The British Banking Association says the proposals have created massive uncertainty in the sector and that the plans were bad economics. But what do my panel of experts think about the Chancellor's major reforms? In the studio, I'm joined by Jason Corayan, Senior Finance Editor at the Economist Intelligence Unit, and Robert Oxley is Campaign Manager at the Taxpayers' Alliance. 
Joining us on the phone is Kevin Mountford, head of banking at moneysupermarket.com, and Dr. Richard Wellings is deputy editorial director at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Rob Oxley from the Taxpayers' Alliance. Do you think the Chancellor's plans are a step in the right direction? Well, look, I think there are good parts and bad parts to what the Chancellor is proposing, but I think what the... You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Daniel Sinner. Four years after the beginning of the financial crisis, the British Chancellor George Osborne announced the biggest shake-up of the banking industry in decades. He warned this week that 2013 is the year we reset our bank. You bank with. The choice to change who you bank with if you want a better deal. Under the Chancellor's banking reform bill, the public will be given more power and more choice. They'll be able to switch bank accounts in just a week. And the time it takes to transfer money and for cheques to clear will also be cut. It's part of his plan to take on the monopoly of banking giants, who he says are dominating the market. For banks, the Chancellor has threatened to break up institutions that break the rules king system. First, we've got a brand new watchdog with new powers to keep our banks safe so they don't bring down the economy. Second, we've got a new law to separate the branch on the high street from the dealing floor in the city to protect taxpayers when mistakes are made. Third, we're going to start with the industry, changing the whole culture and ethics of the business so that it works for you. And fourth, we're going to give customers the most powerful weapon of all, choice. Real choice about who you 